good morning. And here we are again as a community at St. Matthew's, gathering in spirit as the season of Advent comes to a close. This day we gather to celebrate the fourth Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of Love. I'm very glad that we are able to gather in this way, though we can't be together. And I invite you to prepare with me with the lighting of the fourth Advent candle. Advent isn't afraid of the dark. The four weeks before Christmas and each one darker than the last. But Advent doesn't rush to turn on all the lights, chase the dark away. Advent isn't afraid of the dark. Advent claims its deepening week upon week, its longer and longer nights. When the cold reminds us that everyone should be warm enough and treats are meant to be shared and connection transcends distance. When God's spirit arrives under cover of darkness and guides us gently toward hope and hears all our prayers for peace and reminds us of our capacity for joy and brings us the gift of love. Let us pray. Dear God, as the nights grow longer, be with us in the deepening darkness and make our Advent holy and blessed in your presence. Amen. The first reading this day is taken from the book of the prophet Micah, reading from the fifth chapter at the second verse. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. That frosty morn in Bethlehem long ago, when the chill that laid upon plain and mountain was as much from inhumanity as the December night, still he came. When upon the mountainside shepherds kept their lonely watch, and in cities swollen with mirth, travelers and locals alike made their song, trying to forget the long night of winter solstice, where soldiers marched, and with their drill, increased the chill that Bethlehem was not their own. Still, he came. When temple tall and city mall were eager for Roman coin, when law meant acquiescence and church was ruled by state, when officials holy were not devout and the devout were kept without, when justice lacked mercy and peace was far too thin, still he came. When God could find no welcome except in a carpenter's dream and a virgin's womb, when heaven could find no ear except poor sheep herders and no eye but for foreign kings, their fragile yes, however small, was enough. And so he came. Amen.
Let us pray. God of the 2 a.m. pacing, God of the healers racing, God of the moments of fear and frustration, God of the current situation, hear our cries of, will this never end? Hear our shouts of another pivot, what, again? Hear us and help us, please. Help us to be compassionate with ourselves and with one another. Even that person who believes this is all a conspiracy. Help us to celebrate Jesus' birth by doing all we can to help our communities live life and life in abundance. Help us to support all whose work is care of body, mind, and spirit. All who are exhausted from trying to pivot till their lives resemble a whirlwind's chaos. Replenish our well of compassion and care when we are feeling bone dry. Help us to look into the eyes of the cashier, the delivery person, the next door neighbor, the friend, the stranger, and offer them words and actions that communicate that they are beloved. Remind us, O oh God, that we are beloved too. You are the sacred spirit divine. You are the one who rescues. You are God with us in this time and in all others. Amen. That was a prayer that was written earlier this week by our moderator, the Right Reverend Richard Bott. I don't know how old Richard Bott is. I'd have guessed that at most he was maybe a few years older than I am, maybe late 50s rather than mid 50s. But if that's so, I really must bless him for his gentleness and his purity of heart. Because I don't know anyone else who's roughly my age who could have spent an entire week as he has reflecting upon the wearying, presenting need for all of us again and again and yes, again, to pivot in response to this latest outbreak without betraying either by his voice or by a cheeky twinkle in his eye that what he really wants to do is bark out the word PIVOT like Ross from Friends. Like we're all collectively hauling this whole business like a back-breaking sofa above a tiny twisty set of chairs, stairs. And that's the only way it's going to happen. Either we pivot or now that sofa lives on those stairs and nobody's going anywhere. But maybe the moderator's right with his gentleness and purity of heart. After all, despite Ross from Friends barking out that word pivot, and he even had a sketch, that sofa did still get stuck. And what the moderator has instead, along with his gentleness and purity of heart, is the Christmas narrative of the Gospels, which frankly, when it comes to how to pivot, are way better than a sketch. They're a map, and a path, and a promise, and a guide. They're just one pivot after another, those Christmas narratives in the Gospels, by everyone. Because nothing unfolds in the Christmas story the way it's supposed to. Literally nothing. Literally the entire process by which God enters into the world to embrace and hold and heal and fill our human life is just 
one broken set of plans and expectations and hopes after another. Every one of them crashing into the calmness and requiring a pivot or else everything gets stuck. But pivot after pivot after pivot, it all happens. Not easily. There's some pushback. There's certainly a great deal of courage involved and not a few deep breaths and some well-placed angelic intervention. But one pivot at a time, the Christmas story, it all happens. Mary lays down her expectations for the quiet, peaceful life she thought she'd have, and she pivots into a service and a leadership that engages her mind and even her body in ways that are thrilling, but they're also frightening. And Joseph, too, he'd made plans. And they very much did not involve feeling hurt, feeling humiliated, a broken engagement he has to go through with. But he pivots. And when they finally arrive in Bethlehem and the time comes for Mary to have the child, it is very much not okay that there's no room in the inn, but they pivot. And the wise men from the east, when the king they seek isn't in the palace, they pivot. When his life's in danger from the king who is in the palace, they pivot again. And when that danger makes it impossible for Joseph and Mary to return home to Nazareth as they'd assumed, they pivot again too, escaping into Egypt with the infant Jesus where they'll stay until the danger is past. It really is just one pivot after another, almost to the point of being silly. Until it isn't silly at all, when we're so tired of pivoting, and we just need to know it's survivable. It is. But let's not romanticize this. Because yes, there's courage that gets found. And yes, there are deep breaths and changes of plans. And yes, there are new insights into what this birth is really about and who God really is and what really matters at Christmas and how that light shines and can't be extinguished. But let's not romanticize this. Because there is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that when Mary and Joseph arrived in Bethlehem and the time came for her to bear her child and there was no room in the inn, there is no doubt in my mind that Mary broke down in tears. That she'd had it. That it was one pivot too many and she just fell apart. I know she did. She absolutely did. Weary, exhausted, enough, and sobbing. So tired of pivoting, and not at all convinced it was survivable. But it was. Because when it comes to how to pivot, the Christmas story it's a map and a path and a guide, but more than anything, it's a promise that she could, that she wasn't alone, and she could. And she did. It's a promise that we can, and we don't do it alone, and we will. We'll pivot again. And Christmas will find us. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, as we approach the turning of the year and the longest night, 
Remind us of the grace that you unfolded in the darkness. The courage of Mary, the steadfastness of Joseph, the shepherd's surprise and the warmth of a stable. Through darkness you guided the wise men. In darkness, Mary and Joseph escaped safely into Egypt. In darkness, you comfort. You hold us. We are cherished and not alone. We pray, O oh God, for these gifts of Christmas darkness. We pray for all who need courage to live with what can't be changed. For all who need steadfastness to do what's right and make difficult choices. We pray for all who need a reason to hope. For all who need shelter. We pray for all who feel like they've lost their way. For those whose decisions carry vast repercussions. For everyone in danger who needs to escape. For our children, our families, our neighbors, our elders. For all who need comfort in illness, in loneliness, in anxiety, in despair. Help us, O oh God, to pivot again. You unfolded grace in the nearness of darkness so that we'd not be afraid, so we'd know our need for one another, so we could cry if we want to and work out some peace so we'd know we're cherished. Break into our lives with the blessings of Christmas and help us to welcome the gift of your love into our world. These prayers we lift to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us when we gather to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
us go out into the newness of this week, into the darkest night, into the last week before the blessing of the Nativity. With these words, this blessing from the poet Ewan Tate. Always the still, gentle breath of love's most longing message. Do not be afraid, beloved. Be at peace, my children. Watch and be embraced. We, the at the cradle this radiant Christmas, are fragile as candles. And joined this holy night by love's witnesses, children of love and sacrifice in this place. Our hearts flow with the Holy Child's music, our beings streams of light. Amen.